It's biblical values that give families freedom. Um, that's the basis for religious freedom and, and the liberty that we enjoy. But also... I, I would say it, the government should be free from a single religion pursuing religious control over the, over the government. Yeah, we're going there, to the crossroads of politics and religion. It took two days of pushback from Idahoans for a national news agency to deny their own election denier illusion toward the Secretary of State-elect. A claim of fueling doubts had no gas. The objective truth is that the Founding Fathers wanted to base their system of government on Christianity. They relied heavily upon biblical um, values in order to create their system of government, and we've been blessed to inherit that type of system. You know that old adage, and it's worth a reminder this close to Thanksgiving, there are two topics to try to avoid around family gatherings, politics and religion. Well, today on the 208, we're going to talk about both at the same time. And a lot of that is centered around what you just heard Blaine Kanzati say, the objective truth. With religion and lately with politics, that phrase doesn't seem to apply to it easily. And maybe you don't know the name Blaine Kanzati, but you're likely familiar with his work. Kanzati grew up in Washington, went to school in Virginia, and has been in the Boise area, Boise area for about four years. He says he's a Reformed Presbyterian, a member of the Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches. He's also the president of the Idaho Family Policy Center, an organization with three employees and four board members. A small group, for sure, but they've been behind some of Idaho's biggest bills lately, with the goal of infusing Idaho with what they believe are biblical principles. The Idaho Family Policy Center, you guys have been involved with several pieces of legislation. Yes. Which ones? I'm urging you to just stand up and make a point that, that we want to do something different. We, we want to stop this. The No Public Funds for Abortion Act in 2021. They are human life, no matter how small they are. Roll call shows 28 eyes, six, six nays. The one Heartbeat six. Law, 2021 and 2022. Don't let our children be sterilized. Vulnerable Child Protection Act, which was the one that bans sex changes for kids. I would rather my six-year-old grandson start smoking cigarettes tomorrow than get a view of this stuff one time at the public library or anywhere else. The porn library bill. And you can take estrogen supplementally all day long, but if that testosterone is still high, they have a competitive advantage. And then we were the leading organization on fairness women's sports in the state. So we're the state partner organization of Alliance Defending Freedom, which is the one that drafted Fairness and Women's Sports Act. I mean, so there's been a good number of bills in the last few years that we've either drafted or have led the, led the work on. Why is it so important for you to get involved in legislation? Yeah, well, we believe that biblical values play a role in government, and that it's our job to protect those biblical values that have created such a strong society here in Idaho and here in the United States. What are you basing this on, the, the fact that the biblical basis of laws? The Founding Fathers, as they constructed our system of government, relied upon biblical truths as they framed our Constitution, um, as they created the framework for our system of government, and as they formulated public policy. Okay, so where is that? Where, where is that written in our, in our Constitution? In our, how do you know this yeah. about our Founding Fathers? Yeah, well, if you read their writings, if you read our founding documents, uh, starting with the Declaration, it mentions God four times. It mentions the laws of God, um, which is a direct reference to the common law theory that any law that violates God's law is invalid and void. However, our Constitution, our primary founding document, makes no mention of God no biblical references. But Kanzati points to early state laws as evidence. An example of this would be Thomas Jefferson in the state of Virginia who drafted a law called annulling any marriage that's contrary to Levitical law. Levitical law from the book of Leviticus. A bill presented in 1785 in Virginia to outlaw couplings between a parent and a child, a sister and a brother, grandparent and grandchild and other familial relations, except it would also ban interracial marriages and a marriage between a free person and a slave. A bill, by the way, that did not pass. Wasn't it Thomas Jefferson who also said the wall between church and state? Yeah, so there is a very important jurisdictional separation between the institution of the church and the institution of the state. So being, you know, the, the church leaders shouldn't control the state and the state should not impose itself on the church. However, 
that doesn't mean that the state is not under God. Who decides what Christian values should do that? I mean, if it was up to Catholicism, we wouldn't have divorce, right? So again, we have to realize that Christians agree on these moral issues. Do they? They do. All of them? Yeah, historically, the church has been, uh, has presented a faithful testimony to what scripture says. On what about points. homosexuality? Yeah, so, you know, up until last year, sodomy was still illegal in Idaho. Technically, the law was on the books. It was unenforceable mm -hmm. because of a Supreme Court decision, but that law was still on the books. And that was something that all Christians agreed upon. People who struggle with same-sex attraction or who struggle with gender dysphoria are incredibly valuable people created in God's image and our heart breaks for them and we long to see them restored. There are other people out there, leaders, church leaders, that say, if we're gonna use Christianity as a weapon to say these people are wrong and these, we need to create laws to alienate others, that's, that's not what we, sh that's not Christianity is what they're saying. Well, those churches in the last several decades have departed from the truth of scripture. And, um, you know, that, that does not reflect upon the, the consensus among Christians throughout church history. Again, we're not using Christianity as a weapon to demonize others. We're simply saying that there is a universal objective truth and morality that society should operate by. Right? In the same way that Christianity says that it's wrong to rape or it's wrong to murder or it's wrong to steal. Um, these things are you know, basic underpinnings of society. Those are crimes against others, but you're also saying we don't want people to be who they are, homosexual, transgender, drag queens. Well, we would deny that that's who those people are. They're created for so much more than that. I don't think somebody being who they are should be a crime. Um, we're talking about actions, we're talking about behaviors, um, and we're not talking about criminalizing homosexuality. We're talking about criminalizing certain acts that threaten public morality and public virtue and that lead to moral corruption and societal degeneration. Do you feel like that's the overwhelming majority is behind that in Idaho? Well, I think so. Um, on the cultural issues that we work on, there is widespread agreement that there should not be drag performances in public or that children should not be mutilated through sex reassignment surgeries. Um, How many instances of gender reassignment surgeries on children do you know of? Well, so we don't have state numbers on the number that are actually performed. There's no mandatory reporting requirement for those types of surgeries. Where in Idaho is this happening, these surgeries? And these recommendations? It's happening. But where? Brian, we've talked to doctors who work with various health systems who can tell us that they have either doctors or those health systems that are referring children out for surgeries. Okay. Can you give me a name of a doctor that's done this? Well, I'm not going to publicly dox a doctor who fears for his job because he's willing to stand for truth um, and tell us what's going on. Where do we draw the line? There's a lot of people who may not believe what you believe but you're still saying that your beliefs should dictate laws. Well, we're saying that it's our responsibility to persuade people of the goodness of Christian morality and you know Christian culture. We're not imposing our beliefs, so to speak. I mean, we have to persuade a certain number of voters and a certain number of legislators that these moral values are something worth preserving or promulgating in our laws. And they have convinced a certain number of legislators to follow their moral lead. Of those six bills we mentioned at the beginning of our interview, four have become law. Now, granted, three of them are still tangled up in court, but it's quite the batting average. As for who is involved with the Idaho Family Policy Center, two of their board members have a connection to Christ Church in Moscow. Moscow, excuse me, the evangelical church whose mission is to make Moscow, Idaho, a Christian town. And another of their board members also sits on the board of the Idaho Freedom Foundation. We're still waiting for a response from a doctor that Kanzadi claims told him St. Luke's has referred minors for gender reassignment surgery. But I did reach out to St. Luke's and as for what they say, well, they told us in an email, while they do refer patients for services, quote, they don't offer decisions uh, that for services they don't offer. They say they, these decisions on healthcare are left to a physician and their patient and to their knowledge, referrals are not specifically tracked. Okay, so that's how Idaho's Family Policy Center sees it. What's the Christian perspective from, say, an actual Christian pastor? The Reverend Ben Kramer has been a pastor at the Cathedral of the Rockies since 2008. Born in Boise, raised in Nampa under a strict, far-right religious family, by the way. He knew from the age of seven he wanted to be a pastor. But Pastor Kramer's, Kramer's philosophies, they've changed over the years. He says because of studying church history, 
getting two master's degrees and just traveling the world, seeing how others live out their faith in their context. Here is what that taught him. It really taught me that I had a, a very narrow, one-dimensional perspective of Christianity um, compared to what like the Apostle Paul or even Jesus was dealing with in their first century context. And once you learn that multi-dimensional context, it's like this isn't this isn't a faith for either or cut and dry answers, like binaries of this is right and this is wrong. It's it's a faith that invites us to wrestle with these big issues, these big questions of life. There's a large population of this country that hold fast and believe that our country and our constitutions, our laws, mm -hmm. based on God's work, the teachings, the Bible. Mm -hmm. Is that where you stand? My second master's degree really focused on American Christianity because it was growing up the way that I did. It was a huge passion of mine to really figure out a lot of those answers. And I would say it would be tangential at best to say that, you know, scriptures may have been a reference point at, at for some parts of the documents, but to say that they're all biblically based just kind of reduces the complexity of the, of the whole situation and all these other more major influences on the founding fathers. I have come to really uh, fall on the conviction that Jesus in Matthew 16 calls us to be a church, which is way different than an empire. Um, and if Jesus wanted a Christian empire, the scriptures call him the commander of angel armies. He could have taken over Rome by force and established a Christian empire, but he actually established the church, which is an alternative reality to the empires of the world. As a reverend, a pastor of a church, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? As somebody using your faith as yeah. in that way? Honestly, it's, it's one of the biggest points of heartbreak and grief for me when the, the central figure of our faith, Jesus Christ, became a human being and humbled himself and took on a cross, a wash basin to wash feet, to heal, to bring good news to the poor. His first public sermon in Luke 4 was, Behold, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to bring health to the sick, and to liberate the oppressed. And to, so to see that, that faith being co-opted for the sake of political power and control is just, it's one of the, the biggest points of, of heartbreak for me in ministry, a consistent point of, of heartbreak for me. Should religion dictate legislation? I, I think I'm of the firm conviction that a government can only provide religious freedom when it's free from religious control. Um, and so it can't be dictated by one single religion, but religious people who are part of government should be working for the common good of all people, all religions, race, creed, like that's, that's the whole American experiment is that we are seeking the common good and freedom for all people, no matter their religious background or identity. This is from the Constitution of the State of Idaho, Article 3, Section 24, Promotion of Temperance and Morality. The legislature should further all wise and well-directed efforts for the promotion of temperance and morality. Hmm. So by our own constitution, we should be making laws that do not go against morality, mm -hmm. that w w some would consider immoral. Sure. And that's based in faith, in, in, in God, and, and what you're taught, right? I would say morality is a central part of, of any religion. And, and I think my response with that to, would be who gets to define morality um, with so many different philosophies and religions, even in the state of Idaho alone, who then gets to def define family? Who then gets to define morality? What temperance is based on our own religious beliefs? So to take that as a carte blanche, and especially by uh, a culture that is dominated by Christianity, I think Christians can just assume, yeah, I know what morality means, and that's how that family should <laughs> abide by that morality. Doesn't the Bible uh, dictate morality? I, I think that the Bible invites us to wrestle with moral and ethical questions um, in our relationship with God. I think it, we misuse and abuse scripture when we look at it as an answer book. It's one thing to hold those beliefs and abide as a church, as a community with those beliefs. It's another thing to take those theological beliefs, they're not legal, <laughs> they're not scientific, right? They're theological beliefs. As Christians, I feel like our commitment is to abide by our own deep theological beliefs beliefs, but when it crosses the line of starting to impose those things on other people in, in the population, that, I think that's antithetical to the gospel. What would you say if somebody said, well, 
your sect, your de denomination of Christianity has gone too far away from the origin. Mm. I, I, my response would be an encouragement to read church history because I would assume that it's not as cut and dry as they think it is. And so that's really been, been my goal to really try to reclaim this. We worship a humble, incredible God whose lordship is displayed through a cross, not a flag, not a gavel. We, it's displayed through a self-sacrificial love. What is the risk of that if it continues down the path we're on now? I would say that we do have really hard and fast historical examples of where movements like this has led from uh, Emperor Constantine, who made Christianity the religion of Rome and over 1500 years of you know, genocides and crusades and inquisitions through the British Empire. Um, we saw in Nazi Germany how Christian nationalism was used against the Jewish population um, in some horrendous ways. And so it, it, it can, it can, the comparisons can be quite, quite chilling. One thing for sure is that when Christianity crawls into bed with political power, um, the most vulnerable in society always suffer the most. And that is who I feel like we as Christians are called to care about the most. A recent Pew Research study showed, done in 2020, 49% of Americans believe that our law should be based on biblical teachings. 49%, not a moral majority though. Pastor Creamer, who also has a strong following on social media, says he has a problem with such a small group as the Idaho Family Policy Center, seeing themselves as the mouthpiece for a whole group of others. It's a narrow perspective, he says, without considering how diverse and different Christians can be. He also said even the Methodist Church has been going through a split recently. Pastor Kramer says his sect has made the decision to be inclusive to LGBTQ neighbors, not because they are ignoring scripture, but because they've studied the depths of it. Meanwhile, Kanzati's contention in our moralities don't change and shouldn't change, he says. But isn't slavery immoral? Doesn't it violate human rights? Doesn't it limit someone's ability to flourish? We changed that, right? And even just 65 years ago, 24 states had an interracial marriage ban on the books. 24. The same ban proposed by Thomas Jefferson in Virginia in 1785. Idaho even had one, and it wasn't repealed until 1959. It took the U.S. Supreme Court 12 more years to rule such laws unconstitutional. And the point is, I guess, that I'm trying to make is moralities are what we consider immoral or wrong. That changes over the years, doesn't it? Gonzati has made it clear he and the Idaho Family Policy Center plan to push another bill this upcoming session, one that would ban drag performances in public, springboarding off another national trend. Joe Biden was elected president during that election. But one of the things I've seen and experienced as I've traveled around the state is the concerns that Idaho voters have. That's all it took for PBS NewsHour to consider Idaho's Secretary of State-elect Phil McGrain stoking the flames of election deniers when it comes to the 2020 presidential election. 
Well, the day after the 2022 election, they tweeted this. Republican Phil McGrain, who has fueled doubts about the results of the 2020 presidential election, will become Idaho's next Secretary of State, the Associated Press reports. Well, despite nearly an entire army of Idahoans calling out PBS NewsHour for their assumption, they even doubled down on their claim on Friday. However, late Sunday, they seem they could have gotten this message loud and clear because they announced they deleted that original tweet and have reclassified the Secretary of State-elect McGrain as, quote, defends results. So what's this about a classification? Well, apparently PBS NewsHour posted another article on Election Day looking at Republican candidates for governor and secretaries of states and their comments regarding the 2020 election over the last two years. They put said candidate into categories. One, denies the results of the 2020 election. Two, fuels doubts about the results or election integrity. And three, defends the results of the election. In a Twitter thread, PBS correspondent Lisa Desjardins said McGrain's Election day reclassification was based on his debate comments in that IPTV interview or debate, I should say, and not on an assumption. But just that one frame of reference, all you had to do is Google Phil McGrain 2020 election. It's right there. It's also in Time magazine with Mr. McGrain on the cover. Even the article itself pointing out he beat two actual election deniers to win the GOP nomination. Desjardins also said she spoke with McGrain, who said she made his, he made his position clear on the results of the 2020 election. So she thanked followers for understanding that the organization needed a couple days to look into these claims.